Hello and welcome to Hadoop Tutorials at Learning Journal. In one of the earlier videos, I talked about three core components of Hadoop. I introduced you to HDFS and covered some details as well. Now it's time to explore second core component of Hadoop, the MapReduce. The MapReduce has been the most complicated part of Hadoop. To simplify our learning, I further break it into two parts, the MapReduce framework and the MapReduce programming technique. The MapReduce framework provides you various Java APIs, classes and interfaces to create MapReduce programs. It also takes care of a lot of internal things while executing the program. That's why some people refer it as MapReduce Execution Engine. The MapReduce programming technique is a method of thinking and solving many big data problems. It is a unique problem solving approach popularized by Hadoop. It's not a universal approach to solving all big data problems, but it can address many of them. So, which one do we focus most? The MapReduce framework or the MapReduce technique? Using the MapReduce framework has always been a tough task. So the community kept trying for simplification and improvements. That's how we have Apache Spark. The MapReduce engine is being left behind by modern execution engines like Apache Spark. I guess you got your answer. So our primary focus will be on learning the MapReduce programming technique. However, we will also create one example using MapReduce framework to get the realistic view of the MapReduce engine. It will also give you a necessary background to progress into modern execution engines and appreciate them. So let's start. Let me give you a simple problem. We have a file of 20 terabytes. We can't store it on a single machine. We learned Hadoop. So we decided to save that file on Hadoop cluster. Good, isn't it? That's what is the purpose of HDFS, storing large data files. Now we want to read that file and count number of lines in that file. How will you do that? Well, you may say, what's a big deal? I will write a small program to read the file and increment a counter for each line. After reaching to the last line, I will print the counter value. That's it. It sounds like a good solution in a normal world, but not in a big data world. Let's assume you wrote a small Java program and executed it on your client machine. It reads the file from the Hadoop cluster and increments a counter. So you are running a program on a single computer and moving your data to the program for the sake of computation. You are counting the lines at one place and the 20 terabyte of data should reach to that machine to get counted. It will take hours or maybe days to complete this computation just because moving data takes a hell lot of time. The creators of Hadoop realized this fact and solved it using an exceptionally simple mechanism. Let me explain that. Look at your cluster. You have several computers. Many of them are holding some blocks of your data. Everyone has some CPU, memory and disk capacity. Now rethink of your line counting problem. What if each computer can count the lines of their local blocks? I mean count the lines for the blocks stored on their local disk. The counting of 20 terabyte file will be over in just a few minutes. And you know the reason, right? You are not moving the data, you are counting it locally, correct? You have many computers counting it for you in parallel. With these two improvements, your job will complete in few minutes, correct? What do you think? I believe there is a problem. Okay, what problem? We have multiple counts. Each computer knows the line count of its local blocks. But no one knows the final total number, right? We wanted to get the final total count. Hmm, 
Correct. But that's an easy problem. Let's collect all the individual line count from every computer at one place. We can sum it up to get the final total. Yeah, but we will be moving data again. We wanted to avoid that, right? Perfect. You are getting the sense of it. You are correct. Our aim is to avoid data movement. And we avoided moving 20 terabytes of data. Now, we are moving just a few numbers. That shouldn't be a problem. Hmm, you are right. Great. I think you got the core of it. We have broken our line counting problem into two parts. Let me give a name to both of the parts. The first part is called map function. We execute this part on each computer. In fact, we run a map function for each data block. So, if we have 1000 blocks, we run 1000 map functions, one for each block. The map function will simply count the lines in the block. That's it. The second part is called the reduce function. We execute it on a single computer. The reduce function will simply sum up the individual totals and show us the final total. That's it. Great. But I have some doubts. How will a map function read the lines from a block? Who will collect data from each map computer and send it to the reduce computer? How does it all works? Can you elaborate on this? Yes, of course. The execution engine takes care of all these things. Let me show you the code for this example. So, here is the code for a line counting MapReduce program. Let me execute it and show you the result. Then we will look into the details. To run a MapReduce program, we need to compile and package it into a jar. So, here is my jar file. Now, we need to submit it to yarn for execution. I am passing two parameters. The first parameter is the input file name and the second parameter is the output directory name. My data file is tiny, just 20 lines instead of 20 terabytes. Okay, complete. Let me show you the output. Ok, let me explain how it works. To execute a MapReduce program, we need to submit the jar to the yarn. The yarn and MapReduce execution framework will take care of everything else. We will talk about yarn in future video. However, let me explain the MapReduce framework part of it. When we submit a MapReduce job to the execution framework, the first thing for the engine is to plan our job in such a way that it can execute it in parallel. That's what we want, right? Count the lines in parallel. So, the framework will examine our input file and create input splits. Normally, one input split is equal to the one block of data. There are some more details about it, but for now, you can safely assume one block as one input split. So, if HDFS has broken your file into 100 blocks, it is most likely that MR framework will create 100 input splits. Once you have your input splits, rest is simple. Execute one instance of the map function for each split and track the progress. So, the framework will create several map tasks. Each task is a combination of one input split and one instance of your map function. It will assign them a unique ID and schedule them on different computers on your cluster. Ok, so now we understand how a map task is scheduled. Now let's come back to our mapper code 
and try to figure out what's happening there. So, here is the map function. The framework should run this function and pass the data from the associated input split. So, instead of passing a full block to the mapper, the engine will further break it into records. In our example, the record is one line of text. Let's assume that you had an HDFS block of 128 MB that contains 1200 lines. So, the framework will have 1200 records. So, the framework will call our map function in a loop and pass one line in each iteration. Amazing, isn't it? The idea of breaking the block into records by the framework is incredibly powerful. It saves the programmer from a terrible and repetitive work. All we need to worry about is one record at a time. So, if you are building a MapReduce algorithm, you can safely think of your mapper as a loop that gives you one record at a time. There is one more minute detail about the records in an input split. Every record in a split is a key value pair. That's an essential design for MapReduce record structure. However, in our case of a plain text file, we only care about value. The value parameter gets the line of text. Ok, the map function is supposed to give its output record back to the framework. The structure of the output record is again key value pair. So, what are we writing out? Every time we get a non-empty line, we write one and a fixed key. All these map output records go back to the framework. Ok, so you have an answer to your first doubt, right? Let's come to the second one. The framework will also create one or more tasks for the reducer. By default, there is only one reduce task. However, you can configure it to a higher number based on your requirement. For a line count example, we don't need more than one reduced task because we want to calculate the sum at only one place. Ok, so we want to understand how the count reaches to the reduced task. The framework collects all the output records from every mapper. It sorts them and merges them by key to prepare a record for the reducer. The final record structure is something like this. Since we wrote only one key for the mapper, we get only one record for the reducer. So, once we have records for the reducer, the MapReduce execution framework will call the reducer in a loop and pass one record for each iteration. In our example, we have only one record, so the reducer gets called only once. Rest is simple. We just iterate through all of these and sum them to get the total count. The output goes to the framework, which in turn will write it to an HDFS file. Ok, we covered a lot of things. Let me quickly summarize the key takeaways. The MapReduce programming technique is all about modeling solutions in two phases. The map function and a reduce function. The framework will execute multiple instances of your map function on different computers in your cluster. The framework will also attach one input split with each map function instance. The framework will call your map function in a loop and pass one record at a time from the split. The map function is the place where you read data and do whatever you want to do with the data. You can simply count, compute some calculations, filter your rows or transform each row. We will see some examples in next video. The output of map function is a key value pair and it goes back to MapReduce framework. The framework will assemble all the map outputs into one record per key. So, if you have written three different keys as output from your map function, you get three records. 
the framework will pass each record to the reduce function one at a time in a loop the reduce function is where you get all the data for a particular key so you can aggregate the result at this stage we will see some examples in next video the output of reduce function is again a key value pair and the framework writes it to hdfs file that's it good the objective of this video was to give you a high level understanding of mapreduce programming technique and mapreduce framework the mapreduce framework is being left behind by the modern execution frameworks so we will stop mapreduce framework here however in the next video i will explain some mapreduce problem solving techniques Few simple examples are of great value to lighten up your mind with the MapReduce programming technique and it will also take you a long way on your big data journey. Thank you for watching Learning Journal. Please subscribe, like and share to get more videos. Keep learning and keep growing.